Okay, I'm going to start the, the webinar now. Um, th this is going to be telling you about our new tool called QA My Data, which is a health check for numeric data. Uh, we're going to spend about half an hour speaking, and we're going to give you a live demo of the tool as well. Um, let's introduce the speakers to start with. Okay, so um, I'm Louise Corti. I'm the Service Director for Data Publishing and Access. We have Christina Magna, um, Magda, our Senior Data Creation Officer, and Miles Offord, our Hadoop Systems Engineer. All of us have been involved in building this project um, in various um, roles, and um, we're, we're pleased, very pleased to be able to show you the, the kind of the final product. Okay, so we're going to cover the origin of the tool, just very briefly. What's useful when we check numeric data? How we developed our tool? What tests did we look at and what are available in the tool? A quick demo, a very short techie overview, and then something about future plans. All of the slides will be made available on our event, uh, so we'll share them with you. So why do we need to assess data quality? Um, so first of all, um, if we're publishing data and we are a researcher who's created a data set and we're submitting it to a repository, it's useful. Uh, we don't want to send dirty data over. If we're a repository who's receiving data, we want to be checking the quality of the stuff we receive. Um, peer reviewers are um, checking data that's coming in for published analysis, maybe doing some reproducibility on the code, but they want to look at the data set as well. And then data publishing, um, checking the quality of data does support the FAIR principles. That's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. So it's also useful to check the quality of data when you're using it for the first time. So you download a new data source, and you want to check whether it's got errors in or it's good enough for you to use, so you can begin to analyze the data. And then I think if you're trying to teach students around data quality or creating numeric data sets, it's very useful for them to show the kinds of things that can go wrong and the kinds of things they need to look out for. So we want our data to be healthy and safe. So our tool. We had a, a year, year or so's project to develop a lightweight open source tool that helps us quality assess um, data. We call it a data health check because what it does is automatically um, identify some of the most common problems in data submitted in the disciplines that, that use uh, new, numeric methods. So coming from a, a data service as we do, we deal with a lot of um, survey data, numeric data databases, um, and, and this kind of tool is very useful to help us check some of these, given the volume of data that we have in. We also have a self-deposit repository with lots of data flowing in again. And again, this will help us um, do, do some pre-checking before data is actually made available. And we like the idea that it can help um, set some quality data quality profiles for people who are publishing data. So we have slightly different standards for our self-deposit repository and our curated, quality, um, our, our curated repository that deals with some, some very large-scale government survey data sets. We may allow less errors and have a perfect data set for our government surveys, whereas some of the smaller research experiments might, might have some, you know, be allowed a few errors. And we'll show you what we mean when we say errors. So uh, we developed QA My Data, and the idea is that for it to be extensible, people can build on it, doesn't cost anything and, and it's quite easy to deploy. So first of all, if the polls are working, um, I'm hoping they are, but I'm not sure if they are. I just wanted to know how many of you um, are actually in the business of appraising data. Let me know if you can you can do the poll. What you need to do is, is click on one of the options. I'm not sure if it's working, but hopefully it might be. Okay, I'm sorry, the poll's not working. I'm going to have to shut that. Um, I was just basically wanting to know how many of you appraise data uh, on a regular basis, but, um, but never mind. Okay, let me hide that. So, moving on from that, I'm hoping that some of you in the audience actually do, uh, are in the business of, of checking data. So, um, so we want to, uh, if we're publishing data, that's where my archive comes in. We, are, we want to share clean and well-documented data, and we want to share it under the right conditions. So we're looking at both of these aspects. So there are quality issues that do arise in the description of data and in the data itself. 
Um, and also, we want to be sharing um, data carefully, properly, un under the conditions that, that we collected it. And we are looking at uh, privacy impact assessments under, for example, the, the data protection ruling regulation. Um, so a privacy impact assessment or an appraisal of data looking for identifiers is important. And this helps us define the legal gateway for access. So uh, this tool can be used to look, look for some of the common things that may be left in data when it comes to disclosure risk. So here at the data service, we've had a three-tier data access policy for many years. Uh, the first category is open. We really don't find any, anything disclosed in there at all. It's generally highly probably aggregated data or small teaching data sets. And the majority of our data sets fit into the safeguarded section in the middle. So we're registering, we're authenticating to get in. And then finally, we have our control data, which is a space to use personal data through an approved legal gateway. In that case, we're not worried about disclosure risk in there because people can't take data out. They can just take uh, reviewed outputs. So current ways of checking data. Um, when we did some work trying to assess what other archives do and what people who work with data do, we really found that there's lots of different ways that, that people do things. So we generally look looking at the structure of data. We're looking for incorrect or missing or in inconsistent values in a data set. We're also looking for unanticipated accidental disclosure risk. For example, we get maybe get sent a data set in and there's something accidentally left in there that shouldn't be, um, some kind of administrative variable. It, it, that's the kind of thing that, that we need to check for. And then we locate these issues and we decide what we're going to do with them. Either we can clean them and treat them, which may mean going back to the data owner to say, look, we found this in here, what do you want us to do about it? Or we can just flag the errors. Now, when you're um, dealing with massive streams of data coming in, administrative data or transactional data, one probably needs to flag the errors. You're not probably not going to clean everything up as it comes in. So what we found is many data creators and data publishers are, are using manual methods. So although there's data integrity rules that's used in data collection process, for example, in, in CAP instruments, the integrity is built in, so you can't put in the wrong codes. If you're not using those methods, you're likely to have um, errors in, in, in your data. Some of the statistical software commands will help you run things. You can run frequencies. You can make various checks by running basic commands. But there's a lot of eyeballing of data kind of manually. So checking things, looking at um, the variables that, look, you know, that you're worried about, maybe running frequencies, looking at uh, the different kinds of um, outliers in there. A lot of it is, is using manual methods. So how can a tool help? Well, first of all, we can flag the issues. We can, well, what we'd like to do is run a report on the things that we're looking for anyway, and it flags up where the errors are. It doesn't necessarily have to solve them all for you or, or clean them. It's telling you where the errors are, and that can be very useful. Um, we are, we want to be deploying it as a service for our self-deposit repository, so that actually people can do a health check on their data before they submit it. And again, kind of smaller, the researchers doing their own research don't really often know what data quality means um, and, until they get a check back from a repository saying, look, this has got missing values, it's, it's a bit nasty. So actually having those checks up front to know what you're checking we think is very useful. And also this tool can be deployed into um, data publishing pipelines. In, in all cases, if you're streaming data in or bringing the same data in every night and so building it up, you could run these to, to check for, for various things, for known things. <coughs> I was going to ask you what your biggest problems with data is, but I don't think the poll's working, so, so sorry. So what are we checking? Well, we're checking to make sure the values are correct. Do they make sense? We're looking for outliers that are erroneous, or we're looking for um, outliers that shouldn't be there, very low frequency counts, or possibly disclosive outliers, very high income, or things like that. And we're checking um, for the formats of some of the values entered. And I'll give some examples of that. And then, of course, the, the challenge of missing data. Nobody, nobody in the data world likes missing data, particularly when it's not defined. So also, um, we, we'll, we'll also be checking for that. So here's just a very typical example of, of a, a spreadsheet. What's the problem with this data? Let's give you a minute to look at it. I know it's in red, so it's fairly obvious what's wrong, but there's three things wrong there. First of all, we, we have a, a pregnant man. Now, this was a survey conducted in the 60s, and we had binary 
um, coding, so you probably wouldn't expect a pregnant man. Um, the age is a problem. We've got somebody who's minus 10, and we've got a very old person of 126. Well, that could be right, but we might want to check it. Um, and then we've got clearly the wrong data. We've got some timestamps put in the occupational uh, coding um, field, which is wrong. So they're the kinds of things. They're probably accidental, or you've got errors in data collection. A second example is there. Um, we have a timestamp on something. Clearly, something's gone wrong in, in the second row. We'd want to be able to check for these formats to make sure that doesn't happen or it gets rejected or flagged up. And then finally, we have our nice problem of missing data. There's a lot of missing data there, but we don't know why it's missing. Um, was it a don't know? Was it didn't want to respond? Was it just missing? Was it suppressed by someone? We don't really know what it was. And then we need to decide what we want to do, whether we want to treat that all as missing um, or whether we want to indicate um, some, some other flag in there. But we, ne we need to do something with that data. Now, we have got four types of review um, domains that we're looking at. First of all, we're checking for the basic file itself, so errors in, in various things to do with the file. And then we're checking metadata. Thirdly, we check data integrity. That's actually the data itself, the numbers, the values. And then we're checking for disclosure review as well. So we scoped the test by looking at our own procedures to see what we checked for. We prepared some dirty test data sets with all known errors in there and ran it through. And then we reached out to other colleagues and archives and researchers, asking them what they checked for when they looked. And we had, uh, when we ran some uh, workshops with the tool, we got some very useful feedback um, on additional things to look for. So our number one is our basic file checks. Our, our system, our, our tool is checking whether the file opens and whether it's got a bad file name, which might have spaces or something in and it's using something called regex, regular expressions, to do this. And we'll show you how to formulate them later and how to make use of them when you're checking data. The second thing we look for is metadata. And that's a number of things that we can check here. And again, we're going to be showing you a live demo of these kinds of things. So just to whiz through, we're checking for missing variable labels. We may not want any labels that are not, um, that, that, that are not specified. We may be looking for, as I said before, missing values that have no label. We want to know um, which ones are not labeled. We are looking for odd characters in names and labels. So it may be they're misspelt or they don't mean anything and you want them to be clean and, and purposeful, so we're looking for them. We're looking for the length of variable and value labels and we can specify a maximum. So you specify the maximum and it'll flag the ones that, that don't obey that. We are looking at spelling mistakes in the variable labels uh, and also in the value labels using a dictionary file that's plugged in. And again, we've put an English dictionary file in, but you could put a dictionary file from another language in. <coughs> and now we have our data integrity checks. This is checking the actual spreadsheet, the, the, the data itself. It's reporting on the number of numeric and string value variables that it finds. It's looking for duplicate IDs, and we found that in the clinical trials world, that's often the case. There's quite often duplicate IDs in there that aren't supposed to be in there. So you can specify um, whether you want to look for that. You're looking for, or we're looking for, odd characters in string data. We specify the characters we don't want to find. That could be any characters that, that, you, that you don't want to find in there. We're looking at the percentage of values that are missing for each variable. And so we might say, I want to know if any variables have got more than 25% missing values. Let me know which ones they are. And now we're looking at spelling mistakes in string data. And that's useful as well when you've got, um, you know, some, some text within, within the, in the field. And then finally, we have our disclosure checks. <coughs> we are specifying a particular threshold value. I don't want to find any values that are less than five in a, in a categorical data or I don't want to find anything that's, that's very high. Um, so you can actually set these thresholds if you're looking for things like age or um, income, there's many things you can set, and particularly um, frequency counts as well. Again, we're using our regular expression, pattern search again, to look for particular direct identifiers. And this is really nice because the regex can, can actually help you formulate a, a, a code to look for, a generic code, for things like postcodes, telephone numbers, anything really that's got a, a formula formulaic um, structure and then um, although the next one says to be done it is actually done um, and that is you're, you're looking for direct identifiers or for example named entities in string data 
And what you're doing there is you're plugging in a list of stop words that you don't want. So you could have a list of place names, countries, real names. These checks are incredibly resource intensive. And you can ask questions um, to, to Miles about that later. Um, but I think that's important to realize that you might want to run them one at a time. Now, just to say that this is just really looking at very basic direct identifiers. Um, it's not looking for combinations of uh, variables and identifying information. And we do use SDC Micro, which is an R package to look for um, uniqueness in rows of data. And we run that separately. It's not part of this tool, but, but we do run training on that as well, if you're interested. So um, this is an example. Um, the, the tool allows us to put in, uh, to enter SPSS data, SAS and CSV files and run the checks. It's a very modular design. You have various checks that you run. You can change them. You can set a threshold. And also, if you don't want to run the test, you just comment them out in the code. So that's just an example of a configuration file that um, we can show you later on. Just the first one is looking for these odd characters in, in variable labels. And you can see that um, they're, they're, the specif they're the odd characters that we're specifying here. And then at the bottom, you'll see it's very straightforward to run. Um, there's just a, a two lines of, of, um, of, of an instruction that, that tells you to run the checks. This is an example of regular expressions. Again, we're going to ask Miles to say a bit more about this, but that is an expression for email, a very basic expression that will pick up things that have an email address. And if you go onto the, onto the web and put in regex, you can actually find them for pretty much anything, telephone numbers, zip codes, many, many things that have a, a regularity to, to, to them. Um, we have um, reporting that, that's in JSON. It's, it's used to build a very a detailed report. And then we actually have a very, um, a, a very straightforward HTML report that we can read at a glance. And basically, it just tells you which test has failed and which has passed. And then for the ones that have failed, you click on the row and find out where the problem is. So it's supposed to be very straightforward. <coughs> this is just an example of the report that's generated. I fed in my, um, my file. It's given me some summary things. And it's found some bad file names. This is the things that it's found. It's found, found, found something it doesn't like. So I click on the row, and it basically tells me which variables are, are, are guilty of this. So this is the odd characters and variables. So it's just an example of what it does, and um, we'll, we'll show you more of that later when, when we run it live. Okay, right, we're going to do a demo. We're going to do a live demo. So I am going to pass um, the presenter over to Miles Offord, who's going to give you a live demo, hopefully. So just bear with us for, for one minute while we exchange. Now I need to figure out how to show the other screen, um, main monitor two, there we go. So, hello, I'm Miles, I'll be presenting the live demo. So just for clarification, so everybody understands what we're looking at on the screen right now. Over on the right side of the screen, we have a file um, explorer where we have the directories config data, dictionaries, and report. And these are just ordinary folders and they're set up in the way that QMI data um, prefers to see um, the directory structure. Um, and then on the left over here, we have um, a command prompt. A lot of people get kind of scared when they see a command prompt, but it's very simple. We'll go through everything step by step and explain everything along the way. And um, we can see over here, if I type in the command tree, um, we can see here that what we're looking at is the same as over on the file view. So from here, we can have a look at what the QAMI data uh, command can do by typing in QAMD help. Um, which will explain all of the help message, uh, has, a, has a complete help context menu so that you can go through and figure out how the commands work and how to run the commands. Um, so for example, in this instance, we'd like to run the tool. Um, so we can actually run the QAMD help command and then type run to get context specific information about the run subcommand. So in this instance, we can see that there's a load of flags, which are like options where we can pass information into the um, into the system and tell it what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Um, so we can specify a separate configuration file um, or tell it to write out in a different file format, um, which will be a little, make a little bit more sense once we've gone through. So 
from here, what we can do is we can actually type in um, QAMD run and then give it the file name. So at this point, we're going to be looking at a file over in the data directory. So in data teaching, um, and I've got the command here. I'm going to copy and paste rather than type it out myself. Um, so if we um, run this command here where we're saying QAM my data run and then the file name that we want to run it against, um, we're then saying the output flag with the file name where we'd like this to go. So what this is going to do is this is going to create this report file here. So I'll, I'll delete that. Um, and then when we hit enter um, in the command window, um, a progress bar will pop up. Uh, a few seconds later, the file will be checked. And then over here, we will have the report. Um, so if we look at that in a uh, browser window, we can have a look through the report and we can see um, some basic metadata about the file, such as the file name at the top, um, how many cases are in that file, um, and how many variables are also in that file. We can also have a look at more interesting things like how many of those variables are numeric versus how many are strings. So in this instance, we've only got two strings for our 188 variables. Um, we can also see some other metadata as well that may, may or may not be as interesting. But then we can also look as well that we've got a bad file name check that's failed. So in this instance, the file name should match the user specified pattern. And currently, the main issue, the main offending character will be the percent sign and the underscore as our pattern, which we'll show you later on, um, doesn't match and doesn't allow for these characters. Um, but we can also drill down into other checks as well. So for example, we can take a look at the variable odd characters and we can click on that here um, and that will take us down to a more detailed view. So it's located two variables in this instance, a variable own TV and a variable V137 that have got odd characters that um, based on our configuration settings um, are not considered acceptable and has highlighted that to us as a failure. Um, we could go back in and decide that we want to keep those characters and remove them from the variable odd characters list which is currently looking for things like ampersands, um, hash, hash symbols um, and at signs or we could go in remove them from the um, SPSS file and go from there. Um, the configuration file is very, very simple. Um, so it's currently located in the config directory. Um, and then if you take a, uh, open that with a normal text editor, I'm going to open it in Notepad++ right here. Um, the file is written in YAML, which is stands for YAML ain't markup language, um, because programmers like to be funny, I'm afraid. Um, and in here, each check has a section. Um, and then each section has a block that represents the check itself. So in this instance, we've got the bad file name check. It has a description which will show up in the user report. So if you want to support multiple localities, for example, you want to run this check and you have a Welsh speaker or something else, you can change this text here so that the report can reflect that. Um, and then also here we have the regex pattern that is matching for our file name check, which can be changed by the end user. We have multiple other checks as well. So for example, we can look through and we can see that that variable odd character setting and we have all of our characters listed out here that we don't like in a variable. Um, to specify the fact that we'd like to run with our configuration file, you have to specify the dash C flag um, and then specify where our config is. Um, so you'll have to excuse me while I uh, remember the commands. Um, So here now we're running with a the dash C flag, which specifies that we'd like to use this specific config file, which is the one that we have currently open on the right. Um, this is where I've broke it. <laughs> no, there we go. So now when we re refresh this, we haven't changed anything, so everything's going to be the same still. Um, so if we were to go back into our configuration file and add in um, to here the underscore and percent signs into our basic file check right here, I'm afraid, I hope you can see that, it's not, not the largest font, there we go. So we have un added the underscore and the percent signs. We can save that file, go back over to our command prompt, rerun that command. We can wait for that to run. Um, while that's running, hopefully, Fingers crossed. 
if, if I've made my sacrifices to the demo gods, um, the bad file name check has now changed to a pass uh, because we have allowed these characters in our pattern that weren't previously allowed. Um, from here, um, you can take a look at the GitHub page if you're interested in downloading or having a play around with Kiyomo data. Um, and feel free to open an issue with us at any point or send us an email um, if you have any questions or queries at a later time. I'm going to hand you back now to Louise um, and hopefully we should be able to answer any of your questions. Right, just coming back to my screen a minute. <laughs> All right, I just we're just on. Okay. Sorry, just hang on just a minute while I share the like page. Okay, so um, just to continue a little bit with the the presentation. Excuse, excuse the screen there. Um, so just a little bit about software, and you will have a chance to, to answer some questions. Um, we wanted to use open source libraries, and actually quite hard to find. So a library is where it's going to actually import and export various uh, file formats. We looked at the Java libraries that are, are you know, compliant with, with SPSS. We looked at um, R libraries. And we looked at Python libraries and actually couldn't find any really that would actually allow us to do what we wanted to do. So we found something called Readstat, which wasn't really um, that well known at the time, but actually it, it, is, it is quite used quite a lot. We we're quite impressed with it. So the Readstat library is a, a command line tool and it's a C library from reading files. Um, so for, from particular Cisco packages, you can put them in. It was designed as a free statistical data analysis package for the Mac which is interesting. It supports a variety of common file formats, and it's been in active development since 2012, and it seems to be rece receiving security patches and fixes, and it's actually it, it definitely been maintained more as a, as a kind of community tool. So um, if you want to ask anything about Rust, you can ask Miles, but we did try various wrappers um, to wrap around this, and we tried Java, Clojure, R, Python. I think Miles tried just about everything, and <laughs> eventually um, turned out using Rust, which is a really nice environment that he said that it demands that things work, and actually they do. It's very, it's very good for fast-running uh, executables, and also it seems to be very reliable where you can compile many bugs, that, uh, uh, you can um, eliminate bugs at compile time, so you don't have to wait a long time. And it seems to be, have really good documentation and seems to be quite quite friendly overall. So if you want to ask um, information about that, you, you can ask Miles or follow up with him. So it is available on Linux, uh, Windows, and Mac. As Miles showed you, there's a GitHub page where you can uh, download it and use it. Um, it's, it's very lightweight to run. You can actually add information in there. You can set the configuration file and put your own thresholds in. There's quite a lot of documentation, um, actually concise documentation on the wiki page. And if you've got ideas for new tests that you think will be important, we'd really like to hear from you. It's released under MIT license, um, and we are hoping to deploy it as a service sometime this year so that users maybe don't have to run the command lines, although we do think that all users running statistics should be able to, to use a command line. Um, and I think more and more that that is the case. So that's our GitHub space. You can go and look at it. <coughs> and we'd really like you to try it out. So just to say we have actually evaluated this a fair bit over the last year. Our own staff now use it um, as part of our ingest work. Um, we've spoken to a number of peer data repositories who I think some are looking into it or using it. And we've had various workshops with a whole variety of stakeholders really from people who own data, data managers, lecturers who are teaching quant methods who are all interested and, and can see the potential and, and again we'd like to hear back from you if you are going to test it. Um, 
We really do want to try and push the idea of actually being quite open about a data quality profile. Now, th th there's a lot of work to try and kind of implement FAIR guidelines to put some kind of measures in place to score. And that can be quite difficult because uh, with, with FAIR, findable probably is not um, equal to accessible, which is not equal to reusable. So there's lots of different domains that make it hard to score something. But I think with the data quality profile, you can say very clearly what your what, what's acceptable and what isn't. So you may say, we don't accept any unlabeled missing values. That's very straightforward. So we think it's a really good way of saying, here, here's some very clear rules on what we are prepared to accept and what we aren't. So uh, we have a web page, um, which has got the available tests that are there. Um, it's got a download and run guide, which Christina's compiled, um, which is really detailed. It does a step-by-step, -step, every single screenshot. So you really, if you follow it, you really can't go wrong, I don't think. If, if you find anything in there, then you can email us and let us know. But it, it's really straightforward. And it has uh, very nice instructions for how you might edit the config file to set your own thresholds. We've got some teaching resources. We've got a messy teaching data set with all the kinds of things that we showed you, problems and issues. We've got some slides for teaching this and some exercises you can use in the classroom. And we've recently got a blog a blog around uh, the tool itself and also a more, a more technical one. So we hope, hope you, you find those useful. Um, I was going to ask you on the poll, which doesn't seem to be working, how you might use it in your own work, but perhaps we can let you have a think about that and you could maybe um, ask us questions. I just want to thank the whole team. John Johnson uh, led on the specs and the development. <coughs> and Anka Vlad is our um, repository manager for, um, for ReShare, our self-deposit repository. And again, she had lots of input into issues that she, she found in, in data that, that were coming in on a, a weekly basis. And also, um, we worked briefly with the Australian Data Archive, who wanted to put a, a front end on, onto the tool and added one very quickly. Uh, it doesn't allow you to configure the tool, but I think there's lots of ways where you can go and integrate this into your own workflows and do what you want with it. The, the code's there, and you, and you can pick it up and use it. Okay, so that's really all from us. Um, if you want to keep connected, we have an email address, QMI Data. We've got a, um, a, a data service list, and, and we're on Twitter as well. And we'd like to hear from you. So what we're going to do now is we'll take some questions. And we're not going to open up the audio because it can get a little bit chaotic. But we'd like you, if you do, to have a, a question in the, in the box. And we'll just monitor those and, and answer them between us. Okay, and we probably will write um, a summary out for um, for the questions, the answers, in case they kind of they provide a useful FAQ. Right, I'm just looking at the technical ones. Um, <laughs> there's quite a lot of technical tools. Okay, so mostly technical. Let, let's take them in their order. They're there. We've got a guide on how to deploy on Linux. So, Miles, perhaps you can. Um, Tell us yeah, so if you take a look at the GitHub um, repository um, on the wiki, wiki, the GitHub wiki, we um, have a fairly detailed guide on installation instructions um, for getting set up on Linux. Um, the majority of the hurdles you'll find um, will be it getting a, a Rust development environment set up, um, but if you're fairly Linux-y based anyways, it's, it's, it's no more difficult than installing most things on Linux. Um, but all of the packages uh, are listed on the GitHub page uh, for Ubuntu um, 16.04 and 18.04 respectively as well. Um, both, both work fine, both were the um, sort of development environment for um, writing the tool in the first place. So it works flawlessly on Linux. Um, as for migrating to uh, data files to Azure, um, depending on What's uh, when when you would want to run the tool would be dependent on the type of data you're looking at. Um, uh, if you're looking at lots of smaller data, it might be worthwhile to run it as you transfer it across. Um, whereas if you're looking at lots of large files or a, a lot, a lot, you know, considerable number of large um, small files, um, it may be more worthwhile to wait until you've transferred all of your data over to Azure first. Um, you could even make it part of the the, um, the data transfer pipeline um, um, more while migrating your data. Um, so I hope hopefully that's answered your question, Claire. Um, okay, good. Um, what have we got? So um, let me display the messy data teaching materials. Okay, the URI for the the teaching materials. Yeah. Okay, I shall go back. Um, 
hopefully you can see the screen. These sites will be available and actually we'll let you know where to find them afterwards. But it's on the UK Data Service site. If you put QA My Data UK Data Service, you'll probably find the page. But there's a list there of um, um I could just show you the page probably. Uh, yeah. There you go. If I show you this page, you'll see QA My Data. There you go. Brilliant. I think. Yeah, so that's the page there on the on UK Data Service uh, under R and D, and it's just got um, just got a list at the end of all the things you can download. There's a presentation, the tests are here. There's a guide uh, and the teaching examples there. Mm -hmm. um, as for the um, question here about um, examples of disclosure disclosure risk um, that QMA Data um, shows them, um, QMA Data itself doesn't actually score dis um, disclosure risks. Um, you can have it look for common disclosure risks, such as um, net, uh, direct identifiers. So, for example, you can have it look for emails using a regex, um, but it doesn't provide any form of um, like solid score um, as to what kind of disclosure risk a specific file poses. Um, so, it's good for looking for specific things like phone numbers, postcodes, or email addresses, um, and counting those out and giving you um, direct pointers to where those things exist, but it's not um, particularly good for uh, telling you um, how much of a risk a specific file poses, and um, there are better tools out there for that, such as STC and Micro, yeah. um, which Christina will be able to answer any questions about should, 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 they, should they arise. And just to say, the point there really is, um, it's just for, for things that are really shouldn't be in a data set that, that when you're doing a quick scan. So we're not suggesting this is a complete disclosure risk tool, although if you are worried about a particular companies or names or place names of a region, you could actually just have a dictionary with them in and, ch and check them. So it very much depends what you're looking for, but you can you can plug any type of named entity dictionary in there. So, so potentially it could be quite useful. We haven't done any large ones, but we'd like to, it would be useful to try it on maybe bigger data sets to see if it takes a long time. Um, but it's really around um, direct identifier. Right, we're just looking at some more questions here. Um, um, so to answer your question, Lindsay, there about um, whether the tool can see data on SharePoint, um, as it currently stands, there is no support for that. Um, uh, and I'm not particularly sure how easy that would be to get that sort of thing working. Um, again, uh, it, we would normally with QMA data, you'd be looking to run this uh, either hosted somewhere where you'd have some form of tech department hosting this on your on your behalf, and you submit files to it in a, in, in a more data pipeline um, style of uh, fashion, where you submit the file to um, a, a data data store layer, or you run it on your local machine. And most of the time, we advise running it on your local machine. Um, but again, as it currently stands, we don't currently have access to SharePoint data through QMA data tool. No, but what you could do is uh, take a, a, a if, it, if it's kind of moving data, you could take a snapshot as a CSV and run that through because yeah. it, the, the tool copes with CSV quite well. So it may be that um, you, you take snapshots every day and run that particular file through. So uh, I, I think that would be um, that some something would be a, a kind of compromise. Right, let's just have a look. I'm just seeing what the questions there are. Okay, we've got a question about um, do you use any other tool for disclosure? So I'm going to cover that in a minute. Yes, we do. Um, um, Does so the tool work in that context? Lawrence's Laur yeah. question here about um, missing values. So the tool does differentiate between um, the different levels of missing. Um, uh, so if you have a file set to a minus nine, for example, and you declare that as a missing variable and assign it a label, um, the tool won't complain about it being missing. Um, and we'll, we'll treat that as an acceptable missing. Um, and then for non-responses where the data has just not been entered into the file, for example, an SPSS, um, that, that, that's considered a sysmiss value um, and is, is, is treated completely differently. So there are markers within the file that are like attached metadata to, to each, each value. Um, so this, the, the tool can tell between something that's a complete non-response or something that's just missing um, because it's supposed to be missing. Um, um, okay, let's just have a look. Um, I want to use the tool regularly. 
do we, we do currently use um, other tools for disclosure risk in the UK data archive. Um, currently, as far as I'm aware, we use STC Micro. Um, and I think Christina. Do you want to say a little something, Christina, yeah. around um, how we use that? We don't hi. use it for everything, but we do use it sometimes. Hi, Annika. Um, so at UK Data Archive, we actually use a mixture of QA My Data and SDC Micro because, especially with large governmental surveys, sometimes it does happen to have uh, direct identifiers in. So that would be helpful to use QA My Data for. However, when it comes to indirect identifiers and combinations of variables, we would use SDC Micro, either the package in R itself here in-house, uh, but we do teach on the graphical user interface of SDC Micro. Um, it provides all sorts of um, calculations for risk, including the global and the individual risk. Um, it is very handy because having that individual risk in there, you can make a common sense decision whether a pattern is actually risky or not in your data. But if you have any questions about SDC Micro, you can always drop me an email. Um, I am a big fan of the package. Uh, so if you would like to deploy it in your curation uh, workflow, please just please just contact me at my email address. Um, to quickly answer Claire's question there, um, we have considered creating an R package for this tool, but um, my knowledge of R and understanding of R is um, limited to say the least, um, and it uh, would be something that we, we might consider in the future, but would be, as it currently stands, more work than we're willing to put in, um, just because of uh, the way interoperability works between Rust and other languages. It's, very possible, um, and it is done. It, it can be done. Um, uh, I, um, so it is something that we can consider going forward, and would be would be something that we could consider if it was a massive feature request yeah. for people. Um, uh, next up, uh, to answer Graham's question, uh, we if you were to embed. Uh, you know, certain elements uh, into the data file, for example, uh, specific odd characters. When you save that to the configuration file, your configuration file is kept on your local machine. Um, and as long as you keep that configuration file um, safe, uh, backed up preferably, um, then as, as as you make modifications to that, that will persist um, over time. So as long as you're using the same configuration file, always using the dash uh, dash, dash config or dash C um, switch, um, and specifying your configuration file um, the same each time, then you would have repeatability and you would also have um, a, a very, very easy way to share your configuration as well. Okay, um, what else do I have? I think that's all, oh, I think that's all the questions. Does anyone else have any questions in the next couple of minutes? If you don't, feel free to, um, to contact us on QAMIData at ukdataservice.ac.uk to ask anything that you might suddenly think, aha, I need to ask this. Um, we will be putting this webinar up to watch again, and if you go and consult our pages and you want to find out more, do go and have a read of everything that we have available, and if you have further questions, just please get in touch with us. Um, but thank you very much for attending and for listening, and uh, enjoy enjoy our QA My Data tool and, and the data quality it's going to bring for you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.